some of the limitations of a bed based on I-section girder or I-section beam. The beam has its major section, uh, major axis, uh, in, so it's, it's designed to resist loads this way, the way the beam is orientated. In other words, its depth um, is significant in this dimension, its width uh, which uh, is, is, uh, makes up the minor axis is in, in this direction. So we need to consider where the loads are in the beam. So when I look at uh, this setup here, um, one of the major loads is the vertical load on the tool. And uh, this setup, this arrangement, um, uh, seems to be quite adequate for co coping with those kinds of loads. A vertical load onto, onto the center line of the, of the I section uh, beam is, is uh, catered for fairly well. Another load is, uh, is an axial load um, as the tool moves into the work. Um, when, when the tool is quite close to the center line as it is now, um, there's only a very small couple and uh, the bed is, is, is quite capable of taking that. However, when we move out to larger diameters, uh, say we moved out to four inches um, near its maximum, then we find actually there's quite a, quite a severe turning moment in this direction. And that is resisted by the minor axis of the beam, and that, that is not, uh, uh, not going to be quite so effective. So the other um, consideration, which I think is the issue which I faced and I noticed early on, is the radial load. In other words, the load in this direction. Uh, because uh, effectively what we have is we have the tool mounted at um, four and a half inches approximately above the center line, of, above the top surface of the bed, about four and a quarter inches. Um, and, and on the size of this, this machine, that's quite a considerable distance. So you've got a turning moment in this direction. And an I section beam is not very good in torsion. So its torsional stiffness is low. And that indeed is the issue which I discovered. When I uh, set things up and I put loads um, on the tool and I measured deflections, I discovered that indeed this whole assembly was rotating in that manner. So that's why I had to modify the lathe and I'd like to show you the way that I modified that with two extra features on the rear of the machine. So if you look at the rear of the bed, you'll see there are two features here which um, were not in the original design. The first is this tube. I think you can see the section there. Uh, I think it's a four inch diameter steel tube. Um, and it's mounted at three points, uh, each end and the center. And it's mounted off the rear of the I section beam. So what that does is it provides torsional stiffness to the bed. And that, that, solved, that went a long way to solving the rigidity problem that I had with the bed. The other feature is this bar, which is kind of a reaction bar here, which extends from um, the portion of the I-beam under the headstock up to approximately the midway position of the bed. And what this does is it resists a turning couple, which you can probably see if we look from the top of the lathe, and it resists this kind of motion. So the radial cutting force wants to push the bed this way, and uh, this, this bar here uh, resists that turning moment by, by taking it uh, uh, onto uh, the torsion 
well actually not onto the torsion tube really it, it goes onto this this uh, plate here which is attached to the rear of the bed so those two modifications went a long way to solving the problem of rigidity in a I section beam so just to recap here, here we are here is the I section beam um, uh, great at resisting uh, moments in this direction but not so good at resisting um, moments in this direction or lateral forces or torsion in this direction. So that combination of an I-section beam, a torsion tube and this strut uh, for me solved the rigidity problem. So as the lathe took shape, um, it was time to uh, put a proper register on the spindle, uh, which is loosely um, modelled on an ML7. Uh, I think this is a 12 TPI thread uh, with a register diameter and a shoulder. Um, so that feature, together with the number two Morse taper, were machined on the lathe in situ. Um, in process of doing that, I produced this gauge. Um, this was a gauge uh, to enable me to um, to fit the um, to machine the internal threads on the on the back plate for the four jaw chuck and also for the uh, for the face plate. I'd like to describe in a little detail how the headstock bearings were machined. So um, I made a pattern for the headstock. Uh, casting and uh, you'll see that as well as the core prints for the for the two bearings you'll see that there are two lands on either side of the base of the casting and um, the idea here was that this uh, this base would have the same footprint as the saddle and uh, the reason for that is because it was almost always my intention that I would bore the headstock bearings myself once I completed the the bed. So you see from this picture that the uh, that the headstock uh, casting is mounted on the bed and the saddle uh, um, which is on the right hand side there I removed the apron and the apron is mounted underneath the headstock casting. And um, this means that the, the whole assembly is able to slide along the bed together with adjustment from the gib strips and it's driven by the lead screw. So on the left hand side uh, you will see uh, there are two plane bearings which I made and um, you'll see on the right hand side there is a third bearing which is a split bearing uh, mounted off my homemade angle plate. The boring bar um, is uh, shown here. Um, the reason it doesn't extend right the way through to the, the final bearing is because I, I cannibalized it for something else. Um, but uh, basically this gives you an idea of the setup. So the two split bearings, um, I made a pattern for these as well and um, had two cast. The bottom I filed flat and uh, put two fixing bolts in. The bores were actually produced on my pillar drill. I carefully drilled them parallel to the base and uh, finished up with a three quarter inch uh, hole. Um, the finish was as drilled. I split them and uh, put in uh, pinch bolts there so that I could adjust the fit on the, on the boring bar. And uh, in this way, the headstock bearings were bored um, and once I was happy with the size, uh, the headstock was uh, um, was put in position. So I dismantled all this temporary arrangement. Uh, it seemed to be rather a lot of work at the time, but it was successful. So this was removed and the headstock was put in position and the mandra was fitted. And from that time on, more or less, I had a lathe which I could use.
Well, that concludes part two of Homemade Lathe. Um, there will be one more part, uh, which I hope to get out within the next two weeks. Uh, the concluding part, which I think will probably focus on some of the projects which I have undertaken using that lathe over the years. You can see that I'm not in my own, own workshop. In fact, we're staying with our son in Northern Ireland at the moment. And uh, this is his garage and I've been uh, making some shelving and uh, some storage area for him. Uh, so making myself useful while I'm away from my home, from my own workshop. If you uh, would like to follow me, then please do um, hit the subscribe button um, and like if you appreciate the, the, the content. And also uh, comments are really welcome. So if you have any suggestions, uh, if any comments about uh, um, the material that I'm putting up or the presentation itself, that would be, indeed be helpful. So uh, I look forward to hearing from any of you. Thank you.